Welcome to this CNBC special debate on Davos 2013, the global agenda and how the year ahead will roll. Crisis, what crisis? This is perhaps in recent years the first time we've come into a World Economic Forum without the dark clouds of some imminent problem on the agenda. In fact, it feels as though peace has broken out. The European crisis appears to be receding as a hot issue for asset markets. We see the United States debt ceiling being pushed down the road as an issue and the economy gradually recovering in the United States. And of course, the other part of that three-legged stool of risk, China, is showing promising signs of recovery. So, what is there to worry about in 2013? Well, we all wish it were that simple, don't we? So let's introduce our panel and let's get into our conversation here. Um, joining me for our discussion, Frederico Corrado, President and CEO of Embraer Brazil. He's in the aerospace sector. Hugueta Lebel, Chair of Transparency International. Atsutoshi Nishida, Chairman of the Board at Toshiba Corporation. Axel Weber, Chairman of the Board at UBS. And Li Dao Kuei, Economist at Tsinghua University. And I am reliably informed a gentleman who will be going places in the PBOC at some time soon. But correct me, sir, if that information is wrong, but I don't think so. Let's, uh, let's refocus then on the issue at hand here. What are the risks for 2013? Well, right off the top, the World Economic Forum's own analysis once again brings up two very important challenges for the global economy and all of us going forward. One is the imbalance of income and the inequality that we continue to see, and the other one is fiscal <coughs> imbalances. Now, we know that these issues have receded somewhat from the headlines as central bankers globally have flooded the markets with billions of dollars of liquidity. So are we being complacent, or can we actually really start to believe that things are getting better for good. Axel Weber, I think I need to come to you on this one. As a former central banker, now in the banking industry at a commercial level, what would your narrative or description of this moment of relative stability globally be? I think it's as you said in your uh, starting moderation, optimism in the recovery is clearly there. There's the feeling around the rooms uh, the worst is behind us. There's a better mood now. We've seen uh, really a rebound of the global economy. It's bottomed out. Uh, the U.S. is strengthening. Asia continues to grow. European decision makers seem to be more united this time around and actually promise significant measures. But in my view, the mood actually bordered onto complacency. And you know, to show how that evolved on Wednesday, people talked about the tail risk being re reduced. By Friday, it was the tail risks are removed. And I don't think they are. I think it's pretty clear. Challenges remain. Expectations in particular to the role of central banks are too high. The role of central banks should not be overstated. I think some expectation management is in order here. They can provide relief for some time. They can buy time, but they cannot really solve the underlying deeper problems. And I think the time they bought, and they clearly have, and continue to do so, has to be used to do credible structural reforms. Those are long-term solutions that need to be put in place. They will be painful. They will take time. And that was pretty much the message Chancellor Merkel delivered. I heard a lot talk about growth. And I heard a lot talk about deficits. I didn't hear enough talk about investments. And actually, deficits are OK if they are used for investments to make the future better. If they used to fund growth that is unsustainable, we cannot actually justify them in an aging society where basically future generations are deprived of their future. So I think the mood has been good, in brackets, too good to be true. 
and therefore I think some expectation management really clearly is in order at the closing session here. Thank you very much uh, for the comments. Let's, um, if I can bring in um, Nishida-san from Toshiba, because Japan has the latest central bank, really, <coughs> to join the liquidity party. Now, I think Axel Weber is really on the money when he says the mood here among the business community has felt a lot better, even though some of the surveys done by the likes of PwC indicate perhaps business prospects um, may not be as good as last year when people tick boxes on forms. In the conversations we've been having while we've been here, business people do feel energized for 2013. Can I ask you, do you share that excitement about the growth outlook for 2013? And in the context of Axel Weber's rather somber warning about complacency, is it really a good idea that the Bank of Japan has engaged in participating in flooding the marketplace with liquidity? You know, when it comes to the Japanese economy, <clears throat> the new economic stimulus package will be introduced. This will effectively, effectively contribute to picking up Japanese economic stagnation. So from uh, the recovery from stagnation will be seen, but <clears throat> even if Japanese yen is depreciated slightly, okay, what is most important for Japan is to execute the new growth strategy thoroughly. In the past, many attempts uh, failed, unfortunately, probably more than 12 growth strategies were prepared, but none of them could successfully execute. Okay. So this time, new uh, growth strategy will be prepared by new government by the end of June. What is most important is to implement this new growth strategy thoroughly, and so that <clears throat> the recovery from the disaster could be led to the birth of Japanese economy. This is most important issue for Japan. And what about you as a businessman benefiting or seeing some updraft as a result of the actions of the Bank <laughs> of Japan? Since Toshiba is involved in almost 30 for different businesses, from nuclear power business to small semiconductor business. Situation is quite different from industry to industry. As long as social infrastructure-based businesses are concerned, these are going very well. But when it comes to digital products here, like color TV, personal computers, and also semiconductor business, which supports many electronic uh, products, <clears throat> then the situation doesn't seem so optimistic, unfortunately, unless <clears throat> the consumption in European market and also in USA market could recover fully, we will not be able to expect the, the great upturn of the business in those areas. But for the time being, we'll try to improve our social infrastructure-based businesses much more so that those digital product area could recover. So Fred, let me bring you in then and get another business perspective. And you, you come from the aviation sector, from um, a Latin America viewpoint. Please help us understand the way that you currently see the challenges in 2013 around this issue of business confidence and how it relates to those three challenges that appear to have receded as real headlines so far this year. Well, receded or at least paused, uh, put into the future, that created this uh, sense of uh, less despair, if you will, compared to last year. Um, I, I see the world as an inter interconnected world, so I don't believe in any 
decoupling, you know, uh, alternatives. So uh, even for emerging economies such as Brazil, but also even China and India, we just saw a panel a few minutes ago discussing that. Uh, those elements uh, that are still there, they represent a risk, and uh, that affects directly and indirectly uh, the, the emerging economies as well. Uh, the private sector, uh, I believe, you know, uh, requires, uh, as we have more and more confidence on the recovery, on the solidness of the solutions, on the long-term recovery prospect, uh, the investments will be made. The corporations around the world, they are sitting on probably an unprecedented amount of cash. So uh, the question is uh, stressed. So hopefully all the good feelings that we sensed here this week, and I'm, I'm in agreement with what Mr. Weber said, maybe too optimistic, hopefully that optimism will, trans will translate into investments. Because I think the underlying issue is, uh, is jobs. I think this is, this is the actual most important point of the crisis in the world is the unemployment. 202 million people unemployed in the world is a huge issue for everyone. Let me, um, Hugeta, bring you in on this because we know that there are negative social consequences of such high levels of unemployment. Could you share with us some, some insight as to what risks we run through this year unless governments and businesses engage more meaningfully with the challenge of getting young people and the long-term unemployed back to work? Well, I think that, you know, when you look at the issues individually, we can see a lot of improvement in certain areas. It's when we look at the combination of each of the issues that are with us today, including the one of very high youth unemployment in many countries. And in some countries, uh, people below the age of 30 the population below the age of 30 is 60%. In certain countries, up to 73%. Even if half of those are not employed, you could imagine what that means. But it's also some of the other issues that are on our table today. You mentioned inequality, of course. Financial crisis is not over. Corruption is a major issue. It feeds poverty, it seeds violence, it seeds illicit trade in drugs, in arms. That's another kind of issue. We've had civil war, it's not over. We have some new civil wars and social destabilization. So when you look at each of these and you add to that some of the pressure on our natural resources, if you look at the waterways that are shared today, it can be part not of a future crisis 50 years from now, but even starting as we speak. So it's the combination of those combined with the lack of trust in our leaders in industry and in government, which unfortunately doesn't seem to go away. And that trust has to be regained. And of course, there are ways, I think, that this can be done. But you also add to that the instant connectivity of people and the fact that, which is creating people power of a very different kind. And where our youth, I think, uh, are increasingly engaged and savvy. I met at the forum a few times with our young people. And I'm always so impressed with what they bring to us, which we are not using at this stage. And you know, they're saying, for example, uh, our curriculum was established a number of years ago before technology became what it is. We need now to bring that technology into reshaping the curriculum that we uh, need to have as we go into higher education or even in primary or secondary school. Axel, I just want to, to, to bring that point to you because the case has been made that we're through the worst of the emergency. The central banks have facilitated uh, an uplift in asset prices that have brought equity market valuations back to where they were pre-crisis. But what that has done is it has made the owners of assets richer. It hasn't helped the poor or the unemployed. And in fact, we haven't really yet seen a sustained focus by policymakers on actionable ways to address uh, the unemployment crisis, particularly as it affects Europe. Is it time in 2013 
for policymakers to stop thinking we're in a crisis and start dealing with some of the consequences of that crisis, which has been higher unemployment through austerity, and people who own assets getting richer as a result, perhaps unintentionally, of the liquidity central banks are creating. Well, maybe I, uh, in, the, in terms of the question you pose, I would phrase one point differently. Some of the austerity we're seeing is not a deliberate turnaround in fiscal policy. It's the result of having lost market access and confidence of markets and therefore having to basically scale back on expenditure schemes. So what we're seeing is partly the reaction of a deep crisis of confidence. Now, my view is, and you know, it's similar to the company that I now help steer through troubled waters. We've changed our strategy. We made bold announcements in summer, and actually our stock price moved up by more than 60% over half a year. Now, we understand, and pretty much you see the same here, policymakers have made commitment, uh, the mood is better, spreads have come down, so it's a similar situation. When I look at us, at the bank, perfect execution is priced in. That's the same for policy. But if perfect execution is priced in, the risks are to the downside. And that's what people forget. So what is needed is disciplined, on-track delivery of everything that was promised. As soon as there is slippage on reforms, as soon as monetary policy promises are not kept, as soon as anything happens relative to what is priced in, and there is optimal at this point, you will see uncertainty come back. So it's similar to the corporate world that I'm dealing with, and I think policymakers have to learn from that. What we saw last year was a lot of debate about the way forward, and if you do that publicly, it's as bad as in a company. If you publicly debate what a company should do, you, you lose the trust of your consumers and of your stakeholders. If policymakers debate in the open what's the best way forward, that's not a good way. What you need to do is you need to make clear announcement after having had a good debate internally, and then you need to execute. So on the way forward, what we're seeing is, I think monetary policy for where we are now at this stage of the recovery is starting to be too loose for that part of where we are. So, I mean, I hear that central banks actually are continuing to add liquidity. And the liquidity that's already there for three years, a zero interest rate environment, balance sheets that are 30, 40% of GDP, that's at wartime highs. We haven't seen balance sheet relative to GDP as large since the Second World War. And what it does, it basically produces a difficult environment for investors. Yield curves are flat. Investors are really having a hard time to understand the true value of any assets they need to price and trade. And so there are some risks related to this ultra-loose environment. And as we go forward and keep these ultra-loose policies in place, those risks are increasing. And I think policymakers need to be aware of that. What they need to deliver is a credible commitment to keep policy loose as long as needed. They've done that. What we're now waiting for them is to give us a plan, a credible commitment on how they're exiting these policies as the economies are coming back. And that's the part I'm not seeing. That's the part we really have to ask from policymakers and to do the reforms they've promised. Buying time was one thing, using it for the right things in terms of reforms for competitiveness, jobs for a rebound, that's what is needed now. Uh, Lee Dao let me bring you in on this because um, in my experience of discussing these issues in Asia, particularly as they focus on Europe and to some extent now with the debt ceiling and the fiscal cliff in the United States, um, I see eyes roll, hands raised, confusion about the policy mix that is being pursued that leads to such high levels of youth unemployment, people being thrown on the scrap heap of long-term unemployment, measures that apparently are designed to meet some criteria set by a group of policymakers, but seem to have only negative social consequences. China wouldn't let this happen, would it? Well, the Chinese story is very different. Um, in the Chinese case, uh, fundamental forces for growth uh, uh, are still there. So that uh, this year we've seen a gradual, rec last year a gradual recovery, and this year the momentum will carry through. So for the Chinese case, in the Chinese case, the fundamental question is whether necessary reforms will be carried out in order for the economy to be still able to grow down the road. 
uh, five years from now, 10 years from now, uh, a good thing is that the new leadership uh, uh, came to stage towards the end of last year, and the early signs indicate that they are clear commitments to put towards pushing through the reforms. But this is the Chinese part. But before, no, I may also want to add something, follow up something on the previous comments, right? I do worry about uh, potential risks in 2013, which I don't think we have discussed enough about. That is the US situation, right? In Europe, we've seen some meaningful progress uh, through uh, promises uh, delivered by politicians. In the US, my observation is that not even promises, right? Not even enough discussions are, uh, are made, right? All we have seen is that the, the, the difficult problems are pushed back several months down the road, and uh, I do worry the scenario of July 2011 may come back in 2013. If that happens, a nasty dynamics will travel through the financial markets and various negative consequences will be felt in many parts of the world besides the US. Um, if you were a betting man, and I know gambling is popular, but sometimes frowned on in Asia. Uh, but if you were a betting man, what odds would you put on that happening? I would say there is, uh, well, first of all, for the, in, in China, inside China, I've been telling my friends and oftentimes policymakers, we have to be prepared for the worst scenarios, right? For this situation, for the, for the world economy be thrown back into a kind of a confusion due to the nasty, the nasty discussions in the US about the physical consolidation or restructuring uh, through the financial markets. Now, in terms of probability, I would, be, I would say very safely, 30, I would say 30% chance for this to happen in, in the US. I worry, at least from me, me, very conservative, very cautious perspective. Axel, can I bring you in on that? What do you think, 30% chance we revisit the crisis? Having been a former central banker, I really don't like discussing probabilities and uh, risks. So it's not natural to me to put odds on things. And if there is a downside risk, you assume it's 100% and you deal with the downside risk just to make sure things don't get out of hand. So yes, there is an issue, not just in Europe, there are issues in the United States and sort of around the turn of the year in relative terms. European politics, uh, politics looked a lot more relatively more competent. Uh, but the issue really is, look, there is a deeply divided debate in the US about big government. It's not about the end of the year. It's not about the debt ceiling. It's really about the only thing between, and that's the, the situation often being portrayed like that, the only thing in the United States between what many perceive to be big government uh, is the debt ceiling. So it's an instrument that's being used by both sides for a very fundamental debate. How much Medicare, Social Security, and entitlement programs can you afford in an aging society whose demographics have turned and the, the current environment isn't fully reflected that. That's a much more deep debate, and it's not about March and lifting the ceiling. It's more about can the US develop a credible entitlement and Medicare and basic social security uh, environment, and at the same time deal with the dynamics of aging in a medium to long term. And that is a debate that I don't expect any uh, anytime soon to be resolved, and that's why I expect for some time we'll see a lift up of, say, the debt ceiling by small amounts, just pushing that debate out to have it orderly, but not really a big resolution. And that, that's been already clear at the election. I mean, it was a pretty close election, and there are different views in society, in the American civil society, on which direction to go. We in Europe have a pretty undisputed European model that involves a lot more of social cohesion and inclusiveness when we talk about growth. Unfortunately for Europe, we talk about zero growth, so inclusion is even harder to do. Uh, it's all about rich versus poor, north versus south, old versus young. And that's a very divisive discussion if the cake at all doesn't grow. Totally different in China. 
if the cake grows between 7.5%, 8 or 9%, it's all about inclusiveness of growth, not leaving anybody behind. There is just no legitimacy problem in China for an emerging middle class to be affluent. The issue is, can they manage, as an affluent emerging middle class, to take those that are standing outside and on the sidelines of society and, econom and economic dynamics, can they take them into that path? And that's the urbanization debate they have in China, and it's a totally different economic environment and political debate. And I think our societies need to deal with that as going forward. That's the big moral obligation we all have, to make growth inclusive. And I think that was a debate that started here. I've seen it in some of the sessions, and it's important to continue that. Just before we leave this, this area, is there one actionable on this issue of inclusiveness to address the social issues of the austerity that we're seeing that a panelist could share with the audience that really we should be focused on for 2013, that we need to get on with? Fred. I, I, I may contribute uh, with uh, the Brazilian recent years experience. You know, the classical debate about you know, making the, the cake bigger before distributing it better or distributing it before it gets bigger. I think it was somehow answered uh, with the social programs in place in Brazil, the, the hunger, uh, the food program. Uh, and uh, after a decade, uh, we, we, we grew a lot due to the inclusion of about 30, 35 million people into middle class, so leaving poverty into the middle class. So um, it is at least one example of how inclusion actually cross-feeds a, 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 an economical model. I'm not saying we, don't have, we have no problems. We do have issues, of course. Uh, but uh, I think it's a good experience, uh, and it's real. It's, it's there. And, uh, you know, it is an improvement for society, for sure. Brings social, uh, you know, releases social tension. And it's, uh, it's fair, of course. So let's talk some more about the search for growth. And let's move off the problem, shall we say, of fiscal imbalances. And to a certain extent, put aside the question of unemployment. What I have heard a lot here that I haven't heard in many previous recent Davos is is Africa is no longer a frontier market. It is a growth market. It is ticking along at 5 to 6% as a continent, and we need to be there. That's the business community's view that's been coming across loud and clear. On the other side of the coin, what I've been hearing is more instability in the Middle East. The Israeli election outcome has thrown some doubts into people's minds about what 2013 will bring. The tragedy in Algeria, again, has made people refocus on risks rather than opportunities in that particular region of the world. I wonder if I might run along the panel and get some thoughts on, one, Africa, and whether it now is really time to go in if you're not already there, and two, whether you're still willing to go back and try and invest in the Middle East, given some of these issues that have come to the fore since the year started. Um, let me start with um, uh, our Japanese friend, Mr. Nishida. <clears throat> I may not be the right person to answer that question <laughs> because we are not so active, unfortunately, in Africa so far. Of course, there will be a good chance, you know, uh, for our growing in that area including the social infrastructure related businesses. We <clears throat> are investing in a very limited country like South Africa, you know. When it comes to Middle East, then of course uh, we have a close relationship with uh, many countries in Middle East. So <clears throat> we may be able to find out uh, a growth chance, including uh, uh, power business. Uh, for example, thermal power plants and also uh, nuclear power plants, you know, over there. What uh, we are looking for right now is uh, Asian countries, ASEAN countries. They are growing very fast. So we definitely need to cooperate with them so that uh, we will be able to uh, <clears throat> support them 
so that they could construct a very well, you know, arranged uh, social infrastructure, since uh, they are also facing uh, uh, environmental issues. From our point of view, point of view uh, Japan is uh, slightly advanced in uh, controlling uh, uh, the environmental issues, so we will be able to uh, transfer those technologies to them and uh, we can make uh, new businesses over there. Uh, that's uh, what we are thinking okay, right so now. Okay, so Toshiba yes. continues to focus on growth in the Southeast Asia region. Um, Fred, can I bring the conversation to you? Africa, mm -hmm. the opportunity, is pushing into African markets just another example of the search for growth mm -hmm. and the willingness to take on more risk for that growth because traditional markets maybe are not growing any longer. Well, particularly on the aviation sector, you know, uh, a 5 to 6 percent growth perspective in a continent, especially in a continent as large as Africa, which has uh, relatively poor infrastructure, it is, a, it is a plus for aviation because airplanes will be the fastest way to move people around and probably the easiest, uh, the, requires the less investment. Uh, to uh, be the, the, you know, the, 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 the growth engine of a movement of people and cargo. Uh, but I'm taking a broader perspective on Africa, I, I believe, and I participated during this week in several sessions with uh, African ministers, and uh, uh, I think there's a clear consciousness from the various people that, are, that I heard about the need to really strengthen the institutions in Africa. Before this is in place, uh, at least that's their perspective, uh, there will not be a big inflow of investments into Africa because, of course, you know, uh, the, having the, the fundamental institutions working properly is a, is a, is a basic assumption of, uh, of investments. So uh, that, that would be my, my comment on particularly the aviation sector, positive, but I think there is, there is a lot of homework to be done until you see massive FDI into Africa. And do you have a view on the Middle East and the challenge for 2013 for business in that area? Yeah, in the same line, you know, of course, you know, when you have geopolitical tensions as we, as we do, as we see there, uh, this tends, to, of course, to, 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 you know, make people more cautious about investing locally. I think it's, uh, it's inevitable. Fugeta, can I bring you in on this? Because we know both regions are plagued by issues of corruption, um, uh, it's something that um, we see all around the world, so let's, let's just not isolate these two regions, but without deep-rooted institutions, the kind that Fred is talking about, it can create the breeding ground for inappropriate activity. Absolutely, and of course, a lot of what the resources that the world wants now are in Africa because they have not been uh, exploited so far. And the way that this is done can make a huge difference. Either one can exacerbate corruption, rob Africa of its resources, and leave very little behind, or uh, the enterprises and governments together, and multilateral institutions essential values right up front of transparency, of ensuring that all that is being uh, paid to governments locally, uh, taxes, royalties, concession fees, are disclosed publicly. And expect that the governments will also disclose their revenues. Uh, we talk about uh, inclusiveness before, to ensure that this leads to the inclusion of the communities where this is happening right from day one in the development of the agreements along with the national government so that the people are able to see what it is that they will have in return, but also what it is that they, you know, that they can contribute. And you were talking about inclusiveness before. And this is where I think that you cannot leave people behind. You cannot leave women behind, and you cannot leave young people behind. Because through the, the development and of these resources, you can really bring a different kind of social infrastructure. You can deal with corruption, prevent it, and deal with it. And you can also uh, ensure that the physical infrastructure, which is so important in many of these countries, uh, is also there for everyone to benefit from. 
Thank you very much. I, I obviously don't need to point up the China-Africa connection. So, Mr. Lee, can I bring you in to comment? I found the discussion very, very interesting. Sounds like feasibility, feasibility study. Sounds like nothing has been happening in Africa. To the contrary, lots of things has been, lots of things have been, have been, uh, have been happening in, in Africa, and mainly positive. I've been to Africa, and in forums like this, my favorite friends are African friends. I often talk to them, and also in other fora, talk to my African friends, asking what's going on and what are the problems. Seems to me, it's very, very clear, seems to me what's going on there is that the first actions are already there. Investments are already there. I'm talking about not only investments in mineral stuff, but also infrastructure. And these investments are generating spillover effects mm -hmm. upon ordinary people. Of course, there are problems. The problems, in my view, first order problem is not transparency of feasibility. The first order problem is how to mobilize local people, the local population, make sure they are employed rather than for the Chinese companies to bring Chinese employees. That's secondary. But I think, first of all, actions are there. Hopes are there. That's most important right now. What will 2013 bring in the ongoing relationship with China and improvements in infrastructure, given that we've seen some settling down of high commodity prices, the same profit imperative may not be there to drive investment. Well, I do see that 2013 will be uh, one year of continuous change in this regard. That is for Chinese investments in Africa to, to be gradually more integrated into the local community. I don't expect drastic changes in this regard over one year. They are, they are, they are forces on the ground to gradually, to gradually bring the Chinese corporations to, re to the realization that they have to hire more local people. They have to generate, do more social investments. So I do see positive changes, but these changes wouldn't be there overnight. These changes are already in, in process, gradually. Axel. Sorry, um, did you want to come yeah, back I'm in? Just, I just want to add quickly. that there are some two very interesting tools that now exist, and one is the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, which hopefully would go beyond oil and gas but include mining and forestry, where one would hope that the industry is working in all of these countries, not just in Africa, uh, and the governments would agree to this agreement, which is it's an agreement of full disclosure of working together. The other one is the Responsible Mineral Development Initiative of the Forum, uh, which now is in its third iteration being modeled in different countries. And I think these are very interesting examples of tools that already exist to improve uh, that situation that we're talking about. I don't disagree with this theory, however, my observation of economic development in action is that you have to start somewhere. You first have to have investments, then you generate discontents about corruption, then you develop the institutions to fight against corruption rather than imposing conditions of cleanness before making any investments. You have to start somewhere. <laughs> I would just like to add that just, if you don't build yeah, yeah. transparency and the prevention of corruption right at the onset, once it comes into the fold and gets infiltrated, it becomes extremely difficult after for even institutions that are meant to fight it to be able to really succeed. So here we have a good discussion. Sure. Right. And, uh, <laughs> Let's not and Fred, let me bring you in with, a, <laughs> with, with another real, perspective. We one thing that he said, uh, hope, there is hope. Yeah. There is a hope? Hope, yeah. There's big hopes in Africa. I, I agree with that. Yep. But, uh, you know, I, I, I really don't see the things as linear as you described. I, I think things, they, they have to happen uh, simultaneously and without a, uh, a, a profound change. And there has been progress? Absolutely, yes. But uh, we obviously talk to different audiences and I have people, I'm not an expert in Africa. I say that up front, but uh, I, you know, there, is, there are several concerns about the current model, and uh, I, don't, I, I just don't see a picture as uh, beautiful as you described. Okay, so yeah. let's agree to disagree on this point, <laughs> and let's move on. Uh, Axel, I want to bring you in, because I know the banking industry in particular is very engaged with the opportunity that it sees in Africa, if, if, if it's not already there, but I know most 
international brands already have a presence in that region. But could, could you also compare and contrast maybe a little bit with the Middle East? Well, I guess, you know, if I look at Africa, really what we saw here and heard was the 5 to 6 percent growth has been the silent revolution. It's not been talked about a lot. And really, as we heard in the Crystal Award ceremony at the start, inclusion in Africa is largely about dealing with issues that many of our countries don't have, dealing with the HIV threat and uh, basically assuring that there is a basic health care and Medicare uh, for, these, for, for the population there. It's very, very important. Infrastructure building is going on. Institution building is going on. Mobile communication makes, even in remote places, education accessible. Uh, so the future of Africa is the development of its human capital. And they've started that and we're seeing it pay off. And I think that's very encouraging and all of these things need to be done. On the other issue that was discussed here on inclusion, women empowerment, gender diversity in dealing with that, increasing women's share in income uh, in a sustainable way, attacking gender stereotypes at work, all of that is very important in our uh, societies. It's making money work at, with families in Africa that is very, very important there. And yeah. you know, one thing that these economies respect a lot more than we do is the circular economy. So dealing with the environment, respecting planetary boundaries, inclusiveness of growth, eliminating waste. That's all issues that will be very decisive for Africa's development. Uh, we've gone a long way in not dealing with that in, in a reasonable fashion. So, uh, and to my own industry, to banking, yes, but look, if I, if I look, we're, we're starting in, in banking in Africa, basically our, our base in Africa is South Africa. We're dealing across the globe with, with a, a small client base. Uh, the industry, the financial industry, has different challenges, uh, and we heard that. Using, for example, credit card payment to bring means of payment to a broader audience that doesn't necessarily have day-to-day -day access to cash would be very important to be able to bring consumer services to these areas. Straight through internet payments. These are all things that will change the face of Africa and of remote areas. And we need to develop that. And I think the banking industry, that's an area where we can show that the type of products we develop are actually good for the well-being of the citizens, and they can be used to improve living standards and access to education and other areas. So I think the banking industry has a long way to go after this deep financial crisis to really prove to societies uh, the value added of what we're doing. And I think we've only started on that road. And, you know, we've seen a lot of regulation, and it's the right thing to do. There was capital, liquidity standards. A lot of things have been done, but not everything is yet dealt with. The industry needs to develop credible standards and fill the gaps that are still there. We need to show, for example, that in terms of compensation and conduct, that we develop our own standards that are accepted by society. There's a big gap on that now, and I fear very much if the industry doesn't move on those issues and drags their feet, it will be a very, very big backlash that we're seeing in the civil societies if that's not coming around. Now, there's a challenge for the industry that we need to deal with. So I guess all of us have our diff their different challenges, but believe me, being in an industry that comes out of a crisis of a century, the feeling of a lot of work left to do and big changes needing to happen is still there. If you'll just excuse me for personalising this for a moment, you'll know Edelman put out a survey on trust and bankers, I think, come in, what, just a little below governments. Um, but central bankers, I think, probably somewhat higher than both. And in your career change, you've effectively now brought yourself into the group below governments. You know, at the first 20 years of my professional life, I was a university professor. That was even above politicians, central bankers, and bankers. So uh, you could, you could uh, sort of characterize my career as continuously picking the wrong choices uh, and uh, going down the social acceptance ladder. Uh, I'm, I'm OK with that. Uh, but really, you know, not joking, uh, we need to, and the one thing you do see is behavior standards and also uh, ethical background and, and the way we are perceived in society is quite different between the, two, the three groups that I talked about. So, and I've been a member of all of those for some time. Uh, and it's pretty clear, as an academic, the one rewarding thing that I always felt, which drove me into that procession, uh, profession as a young man, was when you are teaching at university, 
19 to 22 years old who have sparkling eyes because they have a great future. That's where you can make a difference. And again, if you're interested with keeping a currency stable, that's where you can make a difference for a lot of people because it's the poorer parts of society. It's those that have small incomes that suffer most if the purchasing power of their money is eroded. So I feel all of these jobs have reasonable mandates that serve the larger society. With banks, it can't be all about profit making. It has to be banks need to prove their value to society moving forward. And if you look at the last crisis, it wasn't the kind of things that were criticized that had to do with retail services and what we provide as client services to retail clients. It was the self-interest and it was the investment in proprietary trading that got out of hand. It was the explosion of trading books rather than the banking books where we provide credit to fund investments in the real economy. So I think banks need to go back to basics and just to put in a word for UBS in Switzerland, which is always a good idea because in Switzerland, uh, the perception of UBS is not very good at this point. We're about to change that and it'll take time. The point is going back to those basics is part of what our new strategy is. And that will prove it's a long race. It won't be a quick fix. It'll prove that banks have something to offer for the social society. Let's just stay on this, this issue of trust for a little bit longer here. And I want to bring you in, Hugeta, uh, just to help us understand where in your organization, you rank various uh, bodies, various um, entities in terms of the trust index. Yeah. I think what, what we do is to really um, get from the people of our countries um, what you know, are the institutions that they feel are more vulnerable to corruption, for example, which are the ones that are more transparent uh, or instead of hoarding information uh, into their fold. And uh, I mean, there's no question that, you know, when you look at governments around the world, those that are more transparent, those that put integrity as a fundamental issue, those that have higher environmental stewardship, respect for human rights, who are more inclusive in terms of ensuring that you hopefully have you know, uh, less inequality, more inclusion of women in the kinds of ways you were talking about, and young people, um, where the rule of law prevails. Uh, I think that, and where there is accountability, where the governments do not feel that the resources, the information uh, belongs to them, as opposed to saying we're only the custodians of the resources of the people of the information of the people and therefore you know this is our basic our basic rule and you know i go back to the beginning of davos and to words from klaus schwab which i thought was very important when he said you know we are the trustees of our common future uh, we are all stakeholders and we need to have moral responsibility to our un un endeavors otherwise uh, human mankind cannot survive in the way that we want it to survive. Uh, and Nishida, so, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, Nishida Sand, can I just turn this on its head for a moment? Um, so who do the companies trust? You as a corporate, who do you trust? Who do you trust? Because we talk a lot about people don't trust companies, people don't trust banks, people don't trust governments. <laughs> You're a company. Who do you trust? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very difficult question to ask. <laughs> Do you trust your government? Do you trust the people to make the right decision when they walk into the electronic store? As long as you know, <clears throat> corporate management is concerned, okay? if you don't trust your employees, you will not be able to expect any good result from them. So this is a must. No? Uh, trust, mutual trust between management and employees. This is a driving force, especially in case of Japan, you know, driving force to expect better improvement, better result, 
and good, good success. Thank you very much. That's a very good answer. Um, so we're very close to the end of the program, and I just want to wrap up, wrap up here. I started off by saying, what do we need to worry about in 2013? And I think we've had a really good conversation about a lot of the issues and agendas that are out there for 2013. But I want to focus on maybe some things that are just off the radar screen for most of us, but because of where you are, you can see these things coming, or perhaps you can prepare for them in case they do come, although they may never. And I'd like to start, Mr. Lee, with you at the end. And I'd like to, if you don't mind, just throw in the idea of social media, because I'm very intrigued about the developments that are taking place in China and the encouragement now for citizens to spy on party officials who may be doing inappropriate things and use social media as a mechanism for reporting that information. I think this is something that's, that's almost happening organically rather than being encouraged, but it is an interesting disruptor. It's an interesting development. But if you don't want to deal with that one, feel free to Absolutely. pick your own. Absolutely. Social media is now a means of uh, progress, of change, definitely. Nowadays, tell you, in China, in a podium like this, a Chinese official would not dare to show his watch because people are watching. What kind of watch? Whether it's a Swiss watch or it's a Japanese watch. If it's a Swiss watch, maybe it's beyond the person's official income. Then corruption investigation can start. Very simple example of social media changing the behavior of government officials. So here, let me go back to something. We have to start somewhere. Economic development has to start somewhere. You first have to invest. You first have to empower people. You first have to make people have a sense of improvement of their livelihood. Then you generate discontent. Then that push through social media and new technology, the progress of institutions. Is it always a healthy thing? And does it create negative feedback? about trust, and God forbid that I bring this up, but even this esteemed forum gets its own fair share of negative social media comment at times, and people talk about it being a jolly of champagne and canapes for people who think they run the world. Are these conversations on so social media necessarily useful in encouraging communities and people to do the right thing and feel the right way about how their lives are run and how other people live their lives? Certainly. I think they are dangerous. dangerous the dangers are in the government reaction. It takes two parties to dance. It takes two parties to make progress. The general public are making good use of the social media technology. However, many local governments are not realizing that they have a responsibility to respond positively to the discontent, right, voices through social media. And if, that, if they are res not responding effectively, then distrust can spread, can spread very quickly, like cancer. Otherwise, if they respond positively, then positive dynamism can emerge. Axel, disruptors, what do you see? Anything that we need to worry about this year? I think we need to worry about a lot of things. My the biggest fear is that 2013 could be a replay of 2012, another lost year, for example, for Europe to recover. Remember, when we came last year into January, February, March, markets were risk on, markets were going pretty well, investments uh, were booming, it was re record profits at the start of the year. The typical start of the year, good part was there. With the Greek elections, the French elections coming up, changing perspectives for policy making, the whole picture in Europe changed, and it needed the ECB to step in and calm the mood in July. We have the French election coming up. We have the German election. There's all sorts of political risks out there that could easily change the perception if they lead to a major difference in where countries and in where governments commit Europe to go. And therefore, we shouldn't be complacent. I think we haven't really fundamentally improved that much. We're more united in promising progress, but that progress needs to be implemented, put to work, and put on the ground. So 
I am not at all relaxed. Uh, we need to watch all of these things out there. There's a huge number of tail risks out there that we need to watch, and we need perfect execution, as I said before, of all the European and the US fiscal plans and monetary plans for this year to work out better than 2012. If I can bring the other panelists to pretty much a one or two word answer, if they want to comment on this, disruptors? I would say that um, I think that the civil unrest uh, can spread if one is not very cautious about it. And I would say we haven't talked about the importance of local governments, where this is a new frontier where we need to spend much more energy on, as it would, not only at the national level. And uh, so to me, this is something that can create major problems. And to ensure that you know, the people that are unemployed, um, that unemployment does not increase, that, that we can reverse that trend. If people feel that they are disposable assets, I don't think that they will just sit back now with people power and the tools that we have for them to connect with each other. Well, thank you very much to our panel for enjoying us, uh, in joining us in this conversation. Um, you know what, let me just do that bit again. That wasn't very good in TV terms, so I'll have another go. <laughs> you can do that. I can do that. It'll be edited. Although people will be watching this live, so. You didn't hear me say that if you're watching live. <laughs> so let me now just thank our panel for their contributions in our conversation about the global agenda. It's been a real pleasure having you all with us. Thank you very much for tuning in to this CNBC special, and we'll see you next time.